Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 196 video cast, 186 podcast for the week ending July 20th, 2023. We're live from just near Wesleyan University for the uh, long course age group champions for Mimi. And she just swam her first event tonight, uh, swam five minutes and 11 seconds for the 400 free and got an a double a cut uh she just turned 11 a month ago so she's very psyched we're very happy for her and this is a picture of her waiting by the block for the 400 which uh uh she didn't you know it was her first time swimming up to the uh, 12 and unders and she crushed it so we're really really happy for her and then a couple things from this week uh these are some mini horses uh, that she got to hang with and I guess this is the lady that owns the horses and brought them over to uh, take a look and uh, And here's a Vornado building which I was in to do Yahoo Finance in studio Just want to show everyone that uh, when we're talking about Vornado, we know the properties uh, Here we are in front again, and that was a, an amazing time uh, and here's a quick nine I got in one night and you can see the big wild turkey behind me and uh, like all good friends they asked which one's the turkey uh, but moving right along I want to thank uh, Taylor Clothier Smith for having me on Yahoo Finance on Tuesday with Shauna Smith and Akiko Fujita uh, that was amazing a lot of fun to be in studio and uh, the segment there were two segments, 10 minutes each. And what's valuable about these segments, which we're going to get to in just a moment, is there's really not a lot more to say about the playbook for the next uh, back half of the year. Okay, so it's everything from the Fed, from earnings, from outlook, from rotation. And the key thing here, there are going to be a number of surprises in this when you listen. Number one, which stocks we would avoid putting new money in at the moment. Uh, you're going to hear that, and I think you're going to be shocked. I think they were shocked, but every time I go on with them, I shock. Uh, they get shocked whether I'm talking about Bernardo three months ago, and now it's up 40, 50 percent, or whether we're talking about Generac, same story. Uh, but we shocked them once again, and I think you're going to be shocked when you when you see some of the thoughts in here, and I think you're going to find it very valuable. So let's cut to the clip. All right, Akiko, you mentioned it, the market gains today. The Dow pushing higher, up 369 points, heading for the seventh straight day of gains. The market's digesting a number of positive quarterly results here from bigger banks. Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, Charles Schwab are the standouts today. Half of the companies in the S&P 500 that have reported earnings in the past week are in the financial sector, giving us a good glimpse at the consumer. This is according to fact sets. So let's talk a little bit more about the results we've seen so far. What it signals going forward for that? We want to bring in Tom Hayes, Great Hill Capital Chairman and Managing Director. Tom, it's good to see you here. So the Q2 setup was similar to what we saw headed into the into the first quarter. Now that we've gotten even more results this morning from Bank of America, from Morgan Stanley, I guess what are your big takeaways just in terms of the health of the consumer and what it signals? Better than expected. The bar was very low. And as we know, the secret to happiness in life is low expectations. So we came into Q1, negative 6.2% expectations. We got negative two. Analysts had to take their numbers up. The strategists were looking for a drop of 20% in, in earnings. Instead, we got a rise. The same exact thing. We expected negative 7.1% coming into this earnings season. We're shooting the lights out. Uh, the average gain over the last 10 years during earnings season is plus 5.3%, which means we could finish up negative 1.7%, and that's going to force analysts to take their guidance up. And if we look at the next two quarters, even now the guidance is uh, plus uh, one tenth of one percent for next quarter, so positive earnings next quarter, and then plus seven per seven point six percent for Q4. So a lot of good things coming, but I think they're coming right now. Uh, Tom, you know, give me a sense of uh, what your read is on where we are in this economy right now, based on the numbers that we've gotten so far. I mean, you heard Brian Moynihan earlier saying, "Look, the consumer has been a lot more resilient than we expected." Uh, the economy is still fairly strong, even though things are starting to slow down. What's your read based on the earnings we've gotten so far in terms of where we're headed? Well, you have an 80% beat rate, Akiko, and you have to keep in mind people talk about negative money, uh, M2 money supply growth. 
you had basically 10 years of money supply growth pumped into the economy in 24 months. So that's going to take a long time to work, work off. And I think that the, the pessimism uh, is, is overdone. It's been overdone. Granted, we're up over 25% off the October lows, so we might have some consolidation. But that consolidation could actually look more like rotation. So while the indices may not quite do as well as they did in the first half of the year, uh, being up mid-teens, maybe we'll get uh, mid-single digits to high single digits. Underneath the surface and underneath some of the sectors that haven't participated, and we've talked about X, the Magnificent Seven, they've started to participate in the last six weeks since I've been on, which we talked about last time. That's where the opportunities are going to be. So uh, if you're just jumping into the indices now, you, you may not be that excited to get 5 or 7 or 8%. But if you're jumping into the 90% that didn't participate the first five months of this year, there's huge opportunities. There are going to be stocks up 30, 50 plus percent. Tom, the beat rates that we've seen so far, is that enough, though, for the market's momentum, this rally to stay intact? Or are we going to have to see maybe some stronger results elsewhere, economic data that's cooperating with a cooling economy, maybe for the Fed to back off in order to keep that trajectory to the upside? Well, people were pretty pessimistic coming into the bank earnings. Uh, other than the revenue was supposed to grow 7.8, which was going to be the highest, people worried about net interest income. That's proven to be better. I love what Brian Moynihan said about commercial real estate. People have been so pessimistic that this was going to blow up the economy. And instead, he's like, it's a building by building thing. It's going to work itself out. And these are going to be extended. They're going to be renegotiated. And it's going to depend on the different uh, buildings. The A class are going to do exceptionally well. The B and C class properties, they'll work out and they'll restructure. So. Uh, a, a lot of positive things happening. So I think the key is is not being tempted with FOMO to chase the things that are up enormously already year to date and look at those things that haven't yet fully participated because that's where all the money is going to come next. And actually, if we looked at the Bank of America uh, Global Fund Manager survey this morning, it was so interesting. In the COVID lows in 2020, the institutions were so skeptical. After the, rally, after the market rallied from March till June, and it just took off, they still wouldn't get in the market. They were still pessimistic. They were still at high cash levels. Guess who bought those first four months? Retail investors got it right off the COVID lows, and it's it, the exact same thing is happening right now. The, the retail investors have been buying. The sentiment has gone up. Institutions actually picked up their cash levels this month. They're still overweight cash and bonds. They have the least risk on since the COVID lows and since the great financial crisis lows. Their growth expectations are still pessimistic. So that is further fuel for this market to to churn higher on the ind indices level, but actually for the laggard groups, that's where they're going to have to chase. They're not going to chase what's up if they're already missing their benchmark. They're going to chase those things where there's opportunity. Uh, Tom, we're a week out from the next FOMC meeting. When you think about expectations right now, uh, nearly unanimous when you, in terms of expecting a rate hike in July, just under the three percent thing, the Fed will hold to a pause. Um, you know, based on the data that we have gotten since the last meeting, yeah. are you in that camp that this is the meeting where we have a hike, but maybe see a longer pause on the other end of that? Well, Akiko, are you asking me what they should do or what they will do? Those are two different questions, what, but both are great questions. What they should do. What, what they, they should, should do, do is they should absolutely skip once again and say we're going to look at the data because they have more than enough cover at this point to justify a skip. When you look at PPI, uh, that was near deflationary levels, up one-tenth of one percent. That leads CPI. CPI was a tick off of a two-handle, and we're still thinking about hiking rates. These things worked on a lagged basis. Between PPI and CPI, they have more than enough cover. You had the lowest job growth with the non-farm payrolls at 209,000 jobs created. You have the U6 unemployment rate at 6.8%. Uh, so the lagged effects of the tightening that have been going on for over a year are being felt. Now they just need to sit back and make sure that trend persists and make sure the data keeps going down. So uh, if I was in Jay Powell's shoes, I would say skip, let's see more data and ultimately turn into a pause. They probably won't do that because it's priced in. The market can handle another hike, but uh, they shouldn't go too far beyond that because when that lag kicks in, it tends to get aggressive. And, and right now they've landed this soft landing uh, opportunity and they could ruin it if they get too, too aggressive and too feisty. So if they do do two more hikes, the odds of a soft landing, what go does that down, Go like down materially. Yeah, it's... Uh, I think you'd go down from a 95% possibility of a soft landing to maybe a, a coin flip. 
The data that the Fed should be looking at, obviously, inflation, CPI, core CPI, is what they're most closely yeah. watching. We've gotten to, on that headline number, not core CPI, obviously, but that headline number, to 3%. Yep. Yeah. If we want to see f further cooling in inflation, how do we get that? H how do we make more progress if the Fed is not going to continue to hike? Or they shouldn't, we, in your view. We can't afford to see more disinflation because we have 120% debt to GDP. Mm -hmm. So the last time we had this much debt and debt service, as you saw the headlines, uh, debt service is now approaching a trillion dollars a year. That's huge. Last time we had debt to GDP at 120% was following World War II. And the way that they got out of it was through nominal growth. They let inflation run between 3 to 5% for five years. And debt to GDP collapsed from 120% down to 63% in just a handful of years. That's the playbook they should be following right now. Acknowledge that, uh, continue to, to talk hawkish, we're going to take it down to 2%, but let it run a little hot so we can bring the debt to GDP down and have it at sustainable levels, have nominal growth run hot, and, uh, and all will be well. So hopefully they're following that playbook and they're reading enough history books to uh, uh, continue. They've got a win here that, you know, don't snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. They've got a clear win here. Skip it. Uh, if they won't skip this month, then, then just go into a pause after this month would be great. Uh, Tom, you know, we started by talking about the banks. Uh, financial is one area that has really benefited from the Fed's uh, rate hike cycle, obviously, because of the income earned on those rates. There's another area, though, that's been hit hard by the Fed's hiking, and that's REITs. I mean, yeah. what are you, what's your investment thesis around that right now? Okay, so the, great question, uh, Kiko. There are two themes that we're looking at now that the Fed is wrapping up, whether they, they should have wrapped up at the last meeting, so they'll wrap up at this meeting. Uh, number one, the dollar downtrend that began in October is going to continue, okay? So that's already happening. We had a short bid to safety in advance of the debt ceiling uh, just a few weeks back. That's now rolled back over. So with the dollar weakening, we like multinationals that get up to 50% or more of their income from abroad. Those increased earnings are really not baked, baked into future estimates. We're gonna start to see those come, come through in the second half of the year. Uh, we like emerging markets is gonna work with a weak dollar. Emerging markets China and risk on with biotech. Now, as it relates to REITs, the second theme besides weak dollar is that we're going to see the middle end of the curve to the long end of the curve, the 10-year, start to get bid, which will compress rates. That helps a number of things. That helps regional banks with their mark-to-markets. That helps REITs start to get bid because they're interest rate sensitive. And, and I know we were on a, a couple of months ago talking Vernado, and people looked at me like I had three heads, uh, but they were kind and polite. And, uh, and Vernado's up now 30 40% since then uh, because the high-quality uh, businesses will do well. The B and C properties, we're not so sure, but the A properties are going to do well. This is very similar to the mall crisis of three, four, five years ago, where everyone said all these malls are going out of business. The B and C properties did go out of business. The A properties, like Simon Property Group, that have Apple, that have Lululemon, did exceptionally well. We think it'll be the same case for commercial uh, real estate REITs with A-class properties like Vernado, which we own. Okay, uh, Tom, stick around there, because on the other side, we're going to talk a bit about your picks, and some that you say, you say to stay away from. Hint, generative AI and the hype around that. Going to be part of that thesis. We're going to continue that discussion on the other side. Super. All right, thanks. Well, big banks coming out strong so far this earnings season. Bank of America shares trading higher, up just about 4%. The company beating on profits and revenue for its most recent quarter. Net income up 19% from a year ago. The bank is a top stock pick for our next guest. We want to bring back in Tom Hayes, Great Hill Capital Chairman and Managing Member. Tom, we just heard from Bank of America Chairman and CEO Brian Moynihan earlier in the hour telling us that he's not surprised about the fact that the consumer has been and will continue to be resilient. What's going to be the catalyst here for Bank of America? Is it the consumer from here on out? Uh, I think it's a few things. I think uh, expectations are very low, and I think the stock has already been derated. So uh, Bank of America trades uh, historically at about a 12 and a half times multiple below the, below the uh, S&P on average. It's now trading at about 8.8 8, 8 .8 times as of this morning. Uh, we bought this stock during the mini banking crisis in late March. Uh, we were looking in the rubble for dislocation, and we said when there's periods of dislocation, uh, we benefit by buying the highest quality, and that's what Bank of America is, and that's certainly what Brian Moynihan is as, as the CEO for sure. 
Um, so, uh, so first off, it's been derated. It's trading at about uh, one times book, which uh, these stocks uh, throughout a cycle can trade from you know, one time at trough to two times at peak. Uh, so there's a lot of runway for the uh, valuation re-rating. Uh, and I think generally, uh, the other thing that he didn't really talk about that they didn't touch on is they took their loan loss provisions were lower than expected this morning. Everyone thought it was a foregone conclusion they would have to take them up a little bit because people are so panicked about commercial real estate, about credit cards, and in fact, uh, they, they took, them, uh, took them lower than expected. So I think the quality of their business, the quality of their book is good. And as that 10-year gets bid, which we talked about before, uh, all their mark-to-market with their loans, with their portfolio holdings are going to go up. So that's going to be an additional benefit for Bank of America. So it's uh, best in class. We love it. Uh, we think Brian Moynihan is a tremendous leader. And uh, you know, having seen how he worked the bank through the financial crisis, uh, he and Jamie obviously are the best two in class. Uh, so, you know, th that's kind of nat my natural follow-up here, Tom. Oh, you talk about B of A being best in class, but is this a play that, you know, maybe those who are watching can say, look, should I be looking at other financials too? How much of this is a B of A specific story? How much of this is about a second look broader financials? Yeah, so what we like to do is we buy high quality when it's on sale. So uh, J.P. Morgan is high quality, but it's not quite as discounted as Bank of America is. We like it trading right around book. We like it, like it trading at uh, eight and a half, 8.8 .8 times earnings. Uh, we like Brian Moynihan. However, the second, uh, we, did, we did three financial plays during the mini crisis in March. One was Bank of America, one was Vornado, which we came on and talked about, Shona remembers very well. Uh, and we also put on a trade with the KRE. We couldn't pick which small regional bank would do well, so we decided to buy the whole basket while it was dislocated, and that started to work out nicely. We think that's going to persist because as the 10-year gets bid, all the mark-to-markets on those banks are going to go up, and you're going to see a bid into small caps, which is 21% financials, and we think that group is going to continue to perform. So as it relates to the smaller banks, we like a basket. As it relates to the large money center banks, we like one pick, and, and that is Bank of America in terms of uh, upside relative to price. All right, Tom, let's switch industries just a bit. Talk about your next pick, and that's Cooper Standard, a stock that has actually done very well since the start of the year. Yeah. What's the bull case going forward? Okay, this is a little-known stock. We actually modeled this off of uh, Charlie Munger, did a similar trade during the recession of 2001. He bought a, a company called Tenneco. Tenneco had fallen from $16 down to one. Cooper Standard during this recession had fallen from uh, $146 in 2017, 2018 at peak auto production uh, when they were earning $7.21 a share, they fell all the way down to $3.50. We uh, initiated a position last May around $5.50. The bad news is it's up 3x, about 200%. The good news is we believe it's just getting started. Uh, why do we think that? Because uh, they were able to refinance their debt out to 2027 so that the, uh, the solvency risk is off the table, which was a, a key factor. A stock doesn't go from 146 down to 350 if that's not a, not, a, not a real risk. So they took care of that. And now auto production is starting to normalize. And we believe it's going to normalize if it gets to 85 to 90 percent of 2017 levels. We believe this stock can earn seven, eight dollars a share again. Now, at its peak, it had a 20 times multiple on those $7. That's why it traded up to 140. Let's say it doesn't get a peak multiple again, and it, and, it, and it gets to $7 of earnings power, and it trades at a trough multiple of 10 times. You still have a $70 stock. This stock is trading at $16.24 today. So yes, it's up a lot since we went public with it. And we think it's just getting started because all the risk is now out of the stock. And now you just wait quarter by quarter uh, for margin improvement. And more importantly, because management is delivering, they can deliver. All you need to see is the industry volume production. And we saw it. General Motors sales were up 19% last quarter. Industry sales are up. We saw it a little bit in retail sales today. And in, you're going to see more and more incentive, incentives from the OEM. So in a 7 or 8 or 9%, environment, we think used cars are going to struggle. But when you, you're seeing it all over the TV, 0% APR, 0.9% APR, 1.9%. 
Before the pandemic, no one cared because money was free. Now that money has a significant cost, rather than buy the used car, you're going to buy the new car and get free financing. Uh, and that's going to do very well for Cooper Standard, which provides all the ceiling systems around the windows and uh, glass, fuel, brake delivery systems, fluid transfer systems, uh, all to the new car producers. So we're pretty excited about this, and we're going to ride the wave in a leveraged way for the pent-up demand because the average car on the road is 13.7 years old, so people need new cars. Uh, Tom, let's talk about some stocks that you're not as excited about. Okay. Apple at one, uh, one of those that you've picked out. Um, uh, is this a valuation issue? Because this is, I mean, Apple is one of those sort of those steady stocks, yeah. right? I mean, is this just about the, the run-up that we have seen in tech overall? Yeah, so these are two of the greatest businesses in the world. So, you know, we're not shorting these stocks. Uh, our, our base case is that, uh, we're going to continue to see a rotation in the second half where the stocks that ran up the most in the first half are going to perform less well. It doesn't mean they're going to crash. It doesn't even mean they're going to go down. It means that they're going to underperform relative to the catch-up trade, some of the groups we talked about, financials, small caps, et cetera. Um, you know, when you look at Apple, though, objectively, uh, their growing earnings, their long-term earnings growth rate for the next five years is expected to be about 7.9%. They're trading at 32 times earnings. Now, you can say, well, it's the greatest company. They should have a premium. Yes, they should have a premium. But over the last decade, most of the time they traded, their multiple was in the low teens because they had the low earnings growth rate. Uh, and that implies a uh, three times price to earnings growth rate uh, peg ratio, which is a little rich. So uh, all we're saying here is for new money, we wouldn't be chasing this stock. Uh, you know, we would certainly be strongly considering it if, if it came down at a lower price, but you may never get that big discount. We're just saying underperformance for the second half on this front. Tom, I'm guessing you're going to have a similar stance as to why you're not liking NVIDIA, given the price evaluation and the massive run up that we've seen over the last several months. Well, look, again, NVIDIA is a great business and going to continue to do well as a business. And they're growing earnings actually at 21 21% uh, long term expected growth rate. So the 59 times P.E. is slightly more justified. Uh, but at 24 times sales, I literally just can't stomach it. Maybe I'm old fashioned, but uh, I can find better things to do. I look for, you know, uh, very simple uh, businesses that I can understand for doubles and triples over a reasonable amount of time, 12 to 24 to 36 months. And I'll leave the, uh, the shiny new objects for others to, to uh, discern. But uh, great business, just a little too rich for my blood. And those who got in early are certainly having the last laugh now with that massive run-up since the start of the year, over 200%. All right, Tom Hayes, always great to have you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Come and we're back. So that really lays out the playbook. It lays out some picks that we've talked about on this podcast. You guys had a leg up. You got all this information ahead of everyone else. And um, uh, now we're going to move on to Friday night. I was on the BBC um, with Mariko Oi, and I want to thank Zhao Da Silva for having me on. Uh, and um, it was uh, it was a night interview, so this was done for my living room. So bear with me. Uh, and you could see the skepticism of bank earnings uh, from the host, and that was consensus before they actually reported. So listen in here to this short clip. Now on to U.S. earnings, J.P. Morgan Chase and Citibank are due to report second quarter results later today. And analysts will be looking for balance sheet strength after the failures of several smaller lenders earlier this year. Let's bring in Thomas Hayes from Great Hill Capital, who joins us live. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. Firstly, can I just ask you what you're expecting in terms of those earnings from those banking giants? Well, right now, the estimates for bank earnings are plus 7% revenue growth, which is actually the highest of all 11 sectors in the S&P 500. I do think, though, we're going to see some guide downs on net interest income because of the higher for longer interest rate environment that we're in moving forward. Uh, however, I also think that that's been priced in. These stocks have been derated. If you look three years ago, they were trading on average at 12 times P.E. Now they're trading at eight times P.E. So there is a lot of bad news already priced in. And as we know, Mariko, the secret to happiness is low expectations. And I do think the expectations are pretty low tomorrow and they may just be able to beat. 
That's very interesting to hear. Uh, at the same time, there have been some worries about the banking sector after uh, the collapse of some smaller lenders. Do you expect uh, some of those big lenders' uh, exposure to those smaller lenders when they report their results? Well, Mariko, it's a rear view mirror story. So even if they do take some type of impairments, it's going to be a one off. It's going to be a backward looking and the market will be able to look through that. What they're going to be interested in is net interest income. And in the case of the big banks, the capital markets reopening and deal flow reopening, it was completely shut down last year in Q2 and Q3. We may see some improvement in Q2 and we'll really start to see some improvement in Q3 as capital markets come back. Uh, so, of course, interest rates is something that everyone is watching. What are the other challenges facing the sector, in your view? Well, I, I think that uh, we want to see loan growth. I think there's some concern over commercial real estate, which in some areas may be overblown, in some areas may be underappreciated. I think what you're going to see as far as it relates to commercial real estate is those A-type A properties are going to do very well through this. The B and C properties are going to do less well, and the banks may take some hits on that front. It will be very similar to what we saw with the mall crisis Sorry, a few Thomas, years ago. We have run out of time, but thank you so much for joining us on the program this morning. Now to time. And we're back. So you could see kind of the pessimism setting in coming into earnings season, which we talked about with Shauna extensively in the last interview, and now how it's played out where they've ab absolutely knocked the cover of the, off the ball with earnings. Uh, the quote of the week we want to get to here is the market can move for irrational reasons and you have to be prepared for that. You need to make big bets when the odds are in your favor, not big enough to ruin you, but big enough to make a difference. And that's from Bill Gross, one of the all time best. And I was um, blessed. I was able to uh, had had a dinner on Tuesday night. Uh, with with some friends over at Fox Business and another guest who is actually uh, uh, COO at PIMCO for 10 years. And, and, and we talked about some of these ideas and uh, it, was, it was just phenomenal to learn uh, firsthand some of, some of the things that happened there. The other thing I wanted to do before we get down to some of the announcements, because we have quite a few uh, ask me anything questions and the feedback I get is people get the most out of the ask me anything questions So we're gonna get get to that in just a second is I'd, I'd really like to take a moment and uh, Welcome all the new people that came in this week uh, For those of you who've been listening, uh, you know that we temporarily lowered the minimum uh, 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 Investment to uh, for those looking to invest with us and the inbound was just unbelievable uh, beyond what we could have imagined and we're very excited to welcome the, the new investors on board. So congratulations to you and um, and the existing as well. We're grateful for your business and uh, and it's been a good year and it's gonna continue to be a good year. So moving right along, uh, this is the dollar index. Uh, we've talked about a lot with our theme on emerging markets, um, but the thing that was really interesting this week is this Kimball charting, and they always put very provocative charts out, but this one caught my attention. And the case that he's making, uh, and the, the headline is incorrect, it says US dollar repeating 2000 topping pattern currently. Uh, it's not the 2000 topping pattern, it's the 2002 uh, consolidation before a resumption of a continued downtrend. And by then, uh, most of the market, certainly the values, had already bottomed and were starting to rally, even though the dollar was still continuing its, its ascent. And the emerging markets rally was just getting started at this level here after the dollar had dropped. If you remember, it was the biggest rally in emerging markets history from 2002 to 2007. And that started right around here, if you look down to 2003. And the case that he's making is, is this repeating? And he's using some Fibonacci retracement levels to kind of imply that this is gonna break through and, and persist down. I mean, our base case has been kind of uh, high to mid 90s would be plenty. But if he's correct, uh, that would support our view over the next three to five years that emerging markets are going to have one of the best runs in history. Uh, and China being 40 percent, that's going to be a major participant. So uh, this is really interesting. So I decided to uh, pull up the commodities charts again and look at the commitments of the traders and what was happening right when he said. And it's kind of interesting because. As you can see, commercials were selling ahead of the top, just like they were selling ahead of the top here. And then when you got to that, by the time you got to that first consolidation, 
uh, they had started buying, similar to what you're seeing now, which might be like, oh my goodness, is the downtrend done? And what you can see is the downtrend was just beginning and it persisted and emerging markets had the biggest rally in history from this period to this period. Uh, and um, you know, even if we don't get anything like that, emerging markets will do great. But if we got something like this, it would be off the charts. So we're, we're excited. Uh, some China updates here. Chinese money managers pumped 351 million into their own products in a show of confidence as they navigate the market. Uh, 60 Chinese mutual fund operators have spent more than 351 million buying their own funds so far this year. Um, the uh, Bank of Communication Schroeder oversees 500 billion yuan, 70 billion US, said it would buy 50 million yuan uh, worth of units in their lo newly launched funds. So they're buying in at the right price. Uh, China's risk of deflation is serious. One economist says it's time to act. And the theme that I want to get out uh, this week is that everything's pointing to them taking action. And the catalyst, I believe, is going to be the Politburo meeting happening at the end of July, uh, which is you know within the next 10 days where they're going to lay out their stimulus for the second half. And I think that's going to be the uh, catalyst. That's going to be the spark that lights the fire. Uh, and uh, and um, we're going to see some follow through on this recent move up and where we start to get to meaningful levels, first being obviously the 120 on BABA and then straight to 180 once we can break through the 120. So very excited about that. Beijing plans to launch 14 measures to support development of platform enterprises. OK, BABA will be the biggest beneficiary. We've talked about that a lot. China's GDP, slow GDP growth raises urgency for more policy support. It's coming at the Politburo in our view. China's economy misses forecast, raising the odds of support for its tepid recovery. So it's all pointing to the Politburo meeting. That's when they do this stuff, and that's happening before the end of the month. China vows to restore and expand consumption to boost growth. Kerry upholds U.S.-China stability and symbolic Beijing visit, so more dialogue is good. Alibaba to launch local versions of its China e-commerce site in Europe. So they're going to go head on with Amazon, which is pretty exciting because that's not baked into any of the estimates on Taobao and, and their e-commerce business uh, to get uh, all this international expansion in, in uh, Europe directly, not just Turkey and Lazada and different things like that. And then here at the end of this article, by the way, this was a shocking article for me. This was from Rejma Kapadia, the biggest China bear of all time at Barron's. Uh, her headline is China's economic recovery is sputtering. Okay, that's in line with her normal outlook. Why it might not be as bad as it looks. And she goes through a bunch of stuff and analyst stuff. But at the end, it said, uh, what to watch next? Green, which is an analyst she cites in the article, is monitoring the Politburo meeting later this month to see how Beijing is thinking about stimulus for the second half of the year. So everyone knows it's coming at the end of the month, um, but they need to see it to believe it because there's been a lot of headlines and indications and lip service but no cold, hard cash. It's time to get on with the cold, hard cash and get this thing humming again because they've got a risk of deflation, never mind inflation. Uh, so they're going to have to get it. And they've got, you know, 20% youth unemployment. So uh, it's only a matter of time before they storm the castle. And uh, I think they know it. But, but like COVID zero, they actually needed to riot in the street before they took action. So maybe that's going to be the next catalyst. China says two pol policies to support business coming soon. All right, coming to a theater near you, moles mortgage easing to spur whole home buying in big cities, uh, vows to boost private economy, protect business, yada, yada, yada. China's Xi met with Kissinger this week, his old friend, quote unquote, amid U.S. tensions. So things are moving in the right direction. Now they just need to announce it and then we're off to the races. The dollar's doing what it needs to do. The businesses are doing what they need to do. We saw retail sales. We, <clears throat> we saw the June holiday sales. So Everything's moving on that front. China ramps up yuan support with fixing, borrowing measure tweak, et cetera. And then finally, this one was probably the most important one, is Chinese billionaires throw weight behind private sector push. Pony Ma, who's the CEO of Tencent, uh, became a backer of Xi's policies publicly, um, where he's basically saying, we must once again embrace the opportunities presented by the coming industrial revolution. We will look ahead with confidence and redouble our efforts. Namely, Beijing is looking to Tencent Alibaba to help restore growth, and they're going to do everything in their power to support those businesses. And they um, 
uh, vowed to treat, okay, in the latest pledges to unshackle the sector, the company, country's top decision-making bodies on Wednesday vowed to treat private companies the same as state-owned enterprises and encouraged officials to consult entrepreneurs before drafting and evaluating policies. Beijing will also boost support for private companies in share listings, bond sales, overseas expansion, according to the statement. These policies are guiding light for the private sector, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So now they're becoming partners because the government needs them. Moving on to the U.S., I thought this article uh, by Morningstar, which puts out a lot of quality uh, uh, research, um, it was called Eight Most Undervalued Quality Bank Stocks. Of course, our favorite Bank of America was top of the list there, as you can see, and they listed a number of others, M&T, PNC, HBAN, that's Huntington Bank Shares, Wells Fargo, U.S. Bank Corp, Truist Financial, and Comerica. So we have basically the rest of this list in the KRE, long dated in the money uh, options, which are now up like, I think, 110%. Uh, I didn't see how they closed today, uh, just in a few months, which is pretty exciting, which includes all these. And we own Bank of America and Bank of America uh, long dated derivatives on top of it. So it's been a good week on that front as well. Americans are borrowing again, which is great news for big lenders. Well, we have known a few. Um, this is also from Kimball charting about semiconductors. He says, are semiconductors setting up for a historic breakout or a double top? I think it's the former, the historic breakout. Um, if you look back through all these uh, years, you get these type of things. So maybe you get a pullback before you finally get the breakout. But these type of consolidations here are pretty normal after they bounce off the uptrend line. And I also think uh, more importantly on a fundamental basis, because this stuff is kind of nonsense to me, um, uh, the inventory destocking is behind us. The electronic glut is working itself through. Uh, electronics are still a little bit weak, but the demand for the chips and uh, as it relates to uh, uh, generative AI is going to be uh, unlimited. So uh, the yield curve inversion is different, says Goldman Sachs. We covered this last week from an AMA question. Uh, bank uh, Fund managers remain mostly bearish despite rising bets on a soft landing for the economy. That is the B of A fund manager survey, which we're going to go through right now. Showed 68% are looking for a soft landing, and yet they're all positioned in cash. So we'll talk about why and what that means moving forward. Uh, bank ETFs bounce with the uh, with this fund, with, they're referring to the KRE, heading for potentially the best month since 2021. That's pretty exciting. We kind of were, were in the mix when no one wanted them in late March, and uh, we put it out here. So everyone here benefited from that. Um, uh, it's funny, you know, a friend asked me, he's like, you know, now that you've uh, let, let in a bunch of people at a million dollars, you know, you put out so much amazing content on the podcast. Um, don't you think people just take your ideas and, and do it themselves? I say some try, but at the end of the day, it's not their work. So they don't size it correctly. They don't get in correctly. They don't get out correctly. They don't scale in correctly. They don't scale out correctly. So most people, unfortunately, uh, and they don't get the best ideas. So uh, they get some great ideas, but they don't get all the ideas. Our number one priority is benefiting our investors. That is first and foremost our guiding light. They get the best of everything that we do all the time. Uh, and then we deliver as much value as we can across the spectrum uh, from the trading service gets phenomenal results as well as the free podcast. And uh, as a matter of fact, I had one AMA question, which wasn't a question. It was actually rather a comment uh, from a guy who has been in the business for 35 years. Um, gosh, I hope I can find this really quickly. Yeah, listen to this. I'm not going to say his whole name, but Alan says, Hi, Thomas. Not to blow a lot of smoke. So you can tell he's been in the business. He's a little bit uh, crusty there. But I just finished watching your podcast. I've been in the business since the 80s, uh, so 40 years. And I think I've learned more from you in the last year and a half than the previous 35. I think the most important lesson I've learned is that you can quote unquote know the future, but you do have to have the mental fortitude to bet on it and stay convicted. I have warmest regards, Alan. So that's very touching and it means a lot to me. You know, we leave everything out on the field every week when we come here and deliver this. And uh, we're really grateful that it's making a difference for a lot of people listening. And this feedback really means a lot. So thank, thanks for taking the time to write that. 
Very grateful for that. Very grateful for all the viewers. This is from Carlton English. Banks are on a roll. Bank, Bank of America's profit got a 19% boost from higher rates. They also did better on um, uh, revenues were up 11%. Profits were up 19%. The provisions, uh, which we covered actually on Yahoo, were lower than anticipated, which is pretty good considering everyone was scared about the uh, um, commercial real estate. I like this article, five beaten down healthcare stocks with a potential for rebound. I think as we go into the second half, we're, we've got enough exposure through biotech and we think that's going to start to run. Um, and, um, and healthcare. So you've got energy, by the way, which is kind of interesting. It's beaten down. We don't love it. It didn't quite fall enough for us to get super interested, but I think some of those trades are going to work. Um, uh, but healthcare, financials, uh, some of these that haven't moved yet, I, I, healthcare is an area to look at. And I think we did an AMA question on Pfizer, which is looking interesting. Um, Insight is kind of interesting uh, in the trade service. We don't have enough conviction for a long-term idea right now. Organon, we want to do some more work on. Uh, and Moderna, we have exposure through through the biotech, but um, these are all going to work, and they're all going to work at once. A lot of questions this week on AT and T and T Mobile. Uh, we'll get into it more on the AMA. Um, my general view is these are both dogs. Um, so whether they have lead lead problems or they don't have lead problems, the problem is the businesses are are kind of dogs. If you have to take one of the other, I would do Verizon is higher quality. Uh, and I do think you'll get a nice trade out of Verizon. Uh, it's not a great business, but it's a good business and it's cheap. So if you, you know, it spiked back up this week. Um, but if you get another leg down on some more headlines on the lead stuff and a bunch of lawyers saying how they're going to get rich, quote unquote, helping people, then um, that might be an opportunity to pick up some Verizon for the long term. As far as everyone worried about their dividend, I wouldn't look at a business on the basis of a dividend. I would look at the business on the, their basis of their ability to compound capital, whether they can pay that out or not, or compound it in the business organically uh, is a different story. And AT&T has just simply proven over and over that they can't. They suck. So uh, Verizon, on the other hand, is a better story. And I would be interested in looking at that on further weakness, but uh, not, there's nothing I'm willing to sell that I currently have to replace it. Uh, but if it did hit new lows for new money coming in, I'd probably consider that a position uh, because we like to buy things low and sell them high for clients, not buy things that have already moved 40% in the last two months for, for new clients. That doesn't make any sense because those are always gonna check back and we can add those later when they do check back. Uh, Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey results. So this was 222 fund managers with 588 billion under management. And um, what you can see here is their growth expectations are the lowest, expecting a stronger economy are lower than the low of COVID in March of 2020 uh, and lower than July of 2008. It's right at the levels of the bottom in the, the uh, tech wreck. And then in the 2009 recovery, that's where sentiment is right now. So for those calling for a top, I think we're going to get, you know, mini pullbacks and, and consolidations for some of the late money that's come in. But the institutional money is still not off the sidelines and you got to force them all back in. This is just like COVID where the retail investor got it right the first four months and the institutional institutions were sucking their thumbs, thinking of all the things that could go wrong. And they missed a you know huge monster rally off the lows, which we called on March 19th in Market Watch. Uh, for those of you who have been with us for a while, saw that and know that. So um, the sentiment is also as low as the 2009 lows. It looks exactly like it, by the way. Uh, the bottom in 2008, then a rally, then a check back. We got that, and then you work higher over the next two years. A monster rally. This is what level of risk do you currently thinking you're taking in your investments? So the lowest level of risk since the 2009 lows how many of you would give you know everything you got to be able to buy equities at the 2009 lows again well there are some stocks right now that are trading at those type of generational levels and our clients are benefiting and um and you can too so um expectations of global recession here's the sentiment here again back to great financial crisis low levels lower than COVID low levels. So this is not, 
why I'm going through all this is not to, to reiterate, but to tell you these are not levels that you see at tops in markets. These are levels you see closer to bottoms in markets. And if you zoom out and stop looking at the S&P, which is weighted by these seven stocks that outperformed the first five months of this year, and you see that 90% of the stocks still have hardly even moved yet, and that's where the opportunity is going to be in the second half, uh, that's where this money is going to go to work. And that's what we covered with Shauna. Their cash levels spiked up last month. So th these are ideal opportunities. I do like to see investors, the most underweight commodities since May of uh, 2020, that's kind of interesting, which is what kind of draws my attention back to a degree to some of the energy trade. I mean, I was looking at uh, Chevron. There's just nothing that's come down enough where I can make a double or triple over the next 24 months with high degree of confidence. There's too many other businesses that I can. Energy will probably go up and some of them will be up 30 to 50 percent. But I need a double or a triple for me to, to risk capital in a high quality business. And I'm willing to wait the 12 to 24 to 36 months because I like to be tax advantaged when I can for clients that need that. Um, here it shows managers are still overweight bonds and defensives like staples, overweight cash, starting to move into emerging market equities. That's going to continue. Uh, most crowded trade is long, big tech. So you don't want to be where it's crowded. It's also crowded on short China equities. These are going to probably mellow out in the case of Ch short China. It's going to unwind completely in terms of long tech. It's going to underperform relative to the rest that haven't yet participated. Uh, tail risks are high inflation, keep central banks hawkish. We think, um, well, we, we shared what we thought about the, the view, but also um, Fed seen hiking final time to a 22 year peak in economist survey. So now consensus is forming that this is the last hike. They shouldn't do it, but they're going to. And then finally, Michael Hartnett over in the fund manager survey puts on the contrarian, he says on crowds and contrarians. He says, long big tech is the most crowded trade. And then long Japan, the biggest short cover in U.S. stocks from 44% to 10% underweight. Uh, first underweight Eurozone yet, your day, biggest overweight global in industrial since February 2020. Biggest drop in healthcare since January 2021. Uh, so here's the punchline, ladies and gentlemen, and we completely agree with what he's saying here this week. Uh, contrarians would go long commodities. Um, you can do that through owning emerging markets, basically. Banks, we're in. REITs, we're in with Vernado. And short tech industrials in Japan. I wouldn't be shorting industrials. I wouldn't be buying Japan. I don't know that I would be shorting it. And I wouldn't be shorting tech, but I wouldn't be putting new money to work, as we said on Yahoo. So, uh, but I do like his long contrarian bets, X commodities. Commodities will do okay, but not, again, we need doubles or triples. We, we don't need 30 to 50% because they've dropped 20%. It's not that attractive to us. Banks and REITs are very interesting and small caps in a major way. As a matter of fact, as it relates to small cap, the same gentleman who wrote me that beautiful note, Alan uh, W., sent me this note from the... Miller Value Fund, Bill Miller, that we posted on our weekly reads, uh, on our weekend reads, I think it was Saturday or Sunday, you can find the whole note. But uh, it was good that he cut out this paragraph. Because as much as I read, I can't read every single word from every single author every single day. Um, but this is a chart of small caps, uh, I can't make that any bigger. Okay. So the key is what Bill Miller is saying here. He said longer duration equities and mega caps may continue to receive ongoing marketplace votes over the coming months. We agree, but it'll be less, less so than they have been. Uh, however, he says, with widening valuation spreads, there appears to be a more attractive long-term reward risk opportunity in the out of favor areas of the market low valuation securities and small caps and we've covered a lot of those the russell 2000 index has been in an extended bear market posting negative rolling 12 months returns for the last 17 months this is very important ladies and gentlemen this is a rare 
historical event, only happening one other time since 1982. In fact, there have only been 10 occurrences over the past 40 years when small caps trailing one year returns were negative more than six, six consecutive months. So let me repeat that. There have been 10 occurrences in the past 40 years when small caps trailing one year returns were negative for more than six consecutive months. In each instance, small cap stocks forward one year returns were not only positive, but posted average returns greater than 25%. So if you missed the big rally in the large indices uh, year to date in the S&P, um, you can get a better outcome historically, probabilistically speaking, by participating in the, in the rotation. Now, they've already started to move, but I think for a dollar for dollar basis, I think you're gonna get more return per risk in small caps over the next 12 months than uh, what we've seen in the last six months. So small caps as a percent of the total equity market is quickly closing in on 4%, similar to the 2020 lows, and they had a rip-roaring rally off the 2020 lows, made a ton of money there, almost half their long-term average. So it's 4% of total equities, it's usually 8%. In fact, you'd have to go back nearly 90 years ago to find a time period under 4% weight. These unloved portions of the market are currently at wide price to value gaps, which we believe will eventually attract investors' interest as the marketplace broadens out, rebalancing the market scale. This is the whole story, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, you say, well, what is small caps? Well, the number one weighted sector in the small cap in index is banks. Uh, so... Um, We've already got you positioned for that if you've been listening to this for some time. Moving right along. Okay, now on to our article of the week, Heart Like a Truck Stock Market and Sentiment Results. Uh, this first picture is a list. There were actually like a dozen of these 0% APR financing deals in U.S. News & World Report. Someone sent me an ad of this one, so I found it through U.S. News & World Report, which is the uh, Nissan truck. They're offering 0% for 60 months plus 3,000 cash bonus. We went through that in the Yahoo interview. If you haven't listened to the Yahoo interview, everything is in there. That was a great one with Shauna. Um, so we go through the song, which is very nice, and how it compares to the markets. We go through the notes of the Yahoo uh, interview, which you already listened to, the Bank of America fund manager survey, and then finally, uh, China updates, which speaks to the Politburo. This was interesting segment. This was on the day that they printed 6.3% GDP growth. And it was amazing to see how negative the media was on China's GDP growth. No one else in the world is growing at 6.3%, but when it's China, it's like uh, they're going into the Great Depression. But if you actually step back and look at this, does this look like it's slowing? This looks like it's recovering, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so, um, and, and it's gonna continue to recover, no question about it. Uh, as China's slowing, you had the CEOs of MGM and Marriott and the uh, uh, hosts were saying, oh my gosh, China numbers were so bad this morning, plus 6.3% GDP growth. Um, and they're like, yeah, well, our businesses are actually doing really well in China. <laughs> Both of them were saying the exact same thing. It was kind of silly season. And then this lady's talking about the uh, stimulus coming after the July Politburo meeting at the end of the month. So you can listen to that on your own time. Now, this is very important, and this is new information, ladies and gentlemen. The AAII sentiment survey jumped to 51.4% bullish this week from 41% the previous week. Bearish dropped to 21.5 from 25.9. The retail investor is extremely optimistic now. This can stay elevated for some time based on positioning coming into these levels, but it would not surprise us to see a little give back in coming weeks, even if we pushed a bit higher first. Keep in mind, institutional investors are nowhere near fully invested yet, so there will be a persistent bid on any bumpy pullbacks through year end. And you'll probably see a handful of three to five percent pullbacks. Maybe you'll get a seven just to just to scare the hell out of everyone. But um, but I would expect to see those three to five pullbacks, and they're going to be met by buying because these guys have to catch up and gals very very quickly. And if you look back historically, just because it's elevated doesn't mean that you're going to crash. Uh, that actually happens in the middle of major rallies, as you saw from 2013 to 15. 
hit 52, hit 55, hit 57, kept going, kept going, kept going. Same thing in 2016, 2017. Same thing, by the way, I think is a better analogy, is uh, off the 2020 COVID lows, if you remember. So it shot right up by July. People were still skeptical. It consolidated after that, but then it kept pushing higher and doubled again. Uh, and then it hit 56.9% again, and it still kept rallying. So don't think that this automatically means the market's going to go down. Uh, it does increase the odds of some sideways consolidation to, to scare people out, but it doesn't mean because, again, as we covered last week, that first move, it doesn't let anyone in. And it keeps pushing higher, and we're going to see that with Baba very soon in our opinion. Uh, but that's what you're seeing with the market right now. Fear and greed's at 82. Again, um, extreme greed, but uh, again, positioning and again, off of a heart attack low. And after heart attack lows, even when things get overbought, they tend to stay pinned overbought for a lot longer than people expect because they're all trained on recency bias, which means the last time it was overbought, we, were, we crashed, but that's just not the way it works. So um, same with the National Association of Active Investment Managers. They're getting exposure, but they had huge exposure for all of the rally from 2020 through 2021, a year and a half, and they were over 100% for over a year and a half. So we're not even at 100. Maybe we got there today. We'll check. You can check it later on your own. But uh, Verizon, you're seeing some uh, unusual long dated option premium coming in. Same with AT&T. Um, this one's interesting. Lionsgate Entertainment. You know, all of these kind of content producers are kind of getting on my radar. Uh, Warner Brothers Discovery, Par Paramount, Global, um, AMCX actually, not AMC movie theaters, but AMC networks, uh, and Lionsgate. I saw a big insider purchase here that was kind of interesting. So uh, we're looking at those, nothing to do yet. They're not high quality businesses, but they're just so beat down. And I think there's going to be some type of catalyst. Maybe there'll be some deals done or combinations or partnerships or stuff like that, which we saw Iger starting to talk about bundling and that type of thing. So um, here's earnings, the top 30 weights of the IBD 50, which is like a growth index. That's Investors Business Daily. Those are the Momo stocks. Their earnings, top 30 weights in the last 60 days have actually gone up, not down, up 2.49% for this year and up 1.74% for next year. So all those stocks that got hit the hardest last year are actually showing improving fundamentals on a weekly basis. Uh, materials uh, is not the case, you know, which we've kind of avoided. There's nothing really in here uh, at all that we have even looked at. Uh, there's one that we've looked at, but we've done nothing with it yet. Literally one out of 30. So that tells you everything you need to know. Um, those estimates came down 59 basis points for 2023 and 99 basis points for 2024, which basically flat. Some economic data from this week. Um, retail sales were a little white. We, we covered with Shauna the things that give the Fed cover to, they don't have to hike this month. They will because they can't stand victory, but um, they don't have to, and hopefully they'll they'll be done with that. But as you look across earnings, on balance, they've just knocked the cover off the ball this week, whether you're talking about some of these smaller banks like Washington Federal um, or the bigger banks, obviously Bank of America, top and bottom line. Here's Novartis, that's different. Morgan Stanley, top and bottom line. Charles Schwab, top and bottom line. Lockheed Martin, top and bottom line. Valet's materials missed on top and bottom line. Even Bank of New York Mellon, which never beats, top and bottom line. PNC, super regional, missed on the top line, beat on the bottom line. Um, transports hit a hit an all time high yesterday, which is all often a confirmatory indicator for the overall economy and the market. So that was good to see. ASML, which makes the uh, uh, advanced chip machines, beat on the top and bottom line. So uh, Netflix missed on revenue. The market didn't like that. Um, Crown Castle is one that we've looked at. We've done nothing with. Um, let's see if that one's gotten away with us uh, from us. I think we talked about that a few weeks ago and uh, weren't able to do anything. So that's still on the table. That would be so, so we'd put some new money to work with that one um, at some point. I, I, I like that one. Um, all right. Uh, tons of Ask Me Anything questions. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, okay. So that's from Alan. Thank you. 
Hey Tom, I've got another stock for you to look into. Toast provides standardized cloud software and entertainment for restaurant reservation ordering and point of sale software. They just signed a deal with Marriott Hotels, high beta stock, but has projected 30% annual revenue growth over the next three, three years. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Gregory, uh, I, I don't really care about their projections, but let's see what they've actually done. T-O-S-T. -T. I mean, I see them everywhere. I know someone that works there. Uh, I think it's interesting, and I, I was more interested in it last year. So their margins are increasing. Uh, what is this? Oh, this is Coifin. I don't want that. Where's the other one? Uh, ticker T O S T. Okay, so you can see their revenues are up 5x since 2019. So that's obviously working. This is a growth story. Their gross margin are improving. So they're at almost 20%. They're losing money. That's a no no for me. Uh, growth investors would be interested in that. Uh, their balance sheet uh, looks pretty healthy. Let's see their debt. So they've got half a billion dollars of cash, no debt. That's good. Cash flow. They're losing money from operations. That's a no-no. Uh, cash from investing, net change in working capital. Uh, cash from financing. So they issued stock. I don't like that. And they're free cash flow negative don't like that so um return on capital is negative so this is not what we do it, um this is probably a new viewer this might work it might not it's for gamblers and coin flippers and uh that's not what we do so we're gonna we're gonna pass and that doesn't mean it won't work but it's just not for us uh moving along srini says is match a sell or hold uh, I think he's referring to the trade service. Um, that is, look, I think, you know, we've looked at this for um, a long-term investment and it's still on our radar. We almost got there and there were some things that didn't make us comfortable. Uh, that's going to probably wind up being an error of omission versus commission, which we're perfectly comfortable with. Um, but I also think there's a decent chance we might get another bite at that apple. Um, maybe this fall when they're shaking out all the late money. Um, you know, I just couldn't get comfort around their competition moat. And I mean, their gross margins are coming down a little bit. It's never been a high compounder, but it's been a solid business. And I think that's probably why we pass. As you can see, revenues, you know, today are what they were in 2016. So I think that's kind of why we pass. It's like, yes, it's cheap, but it's kind of like dead. It's not really growing, but it still throws off. It's still, I think it's still highly cash generative. Yeah. That's the free cash flow. Yeah. So, you know. It's kind of like a declining business that's a cash machine. It just wasn't certain enough for us to put real money behind it. But great question, Regan. Um, new subscriber to service, two-part inquiry. Are there stocks mentioned in today's video cast, 195, that are part of the service? Uh, no, those are all for clients and investors. Uh, are there updates given on longer-term positions? No, we do those for clients. Um, the trade service is just shorter-term uh, in the money, put spreads and call spreads, which is phenomenal, but it's different than what we do for clients, um, which is compound capital over the long term. So, uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. okay, so thank you, Regan. Next, um, that's Alan's nice comments. Jay, been watching uh, T and VZ falling to record lows with that news of toxic lead cables. I guess the smart money would wait for some consolidation rather than catching a falling knife. What do you think? Dividends, it could certainly be in jeopardy if huge settlements in zoo. Would love to hear your thoughts, Jay, in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, we have like three questions. Uh, Bob says, uh, uh, of a Wall Street Journal head headliner story this week. Uh, do you think um, AT&T and Verizon are going to be like 3M? Well, here's the difference. I'm getting into 3M two years after this stuff became public and they worked through it 
and they had to deal with all the BS and we were buying in the 90s and now it's $104, whoop de doo But it's just getting started. So the thing that you have to worry about with AT&T and Verizon is that you're, you know, this is kind of when all the legal stuff came out up here, you can see on the chart. And here we are now, this is when we entered. What if they go through two years of BS or four or five, like uh, 3M did before it becomes viable? I don't think it's gonna be as significant. So I do think there's probably an opportunity for Verizon because it's a better business than AT&T. But um, I, I'm not even gonna look at AT&T because I think it's just, uh, it's not for me. But we can do a quick analysis on Verizon. Um, you know, this thing's down from 53 to 32. So it's not even down 50%. So, I mean, in the perfect world, I might get a double. I'm not in the business to might get a double. I'm in the business to get multi-baggers in a reasonable period of time. Some happen in months. Some happen more, more likely than not happen in a year to three years. Uh, but uh, this is not in the lexicon of a multi-bagger. So just because it fell a lot in one day doesn't mean I have to buy it. Um, it's, it's a dog with fleas. I mean, that's, that's basically it. So if you want to do it for a trade, have at it. And you'll probably, you know, you could probably make 30, 40% in a few months before it goes back down and people can't quantify the litigation risk and yada, yada, yada. You want to buy this after it's played out for the next two years and they're nearing settlements like, like we have happening with 3M right now. That's the time to buy it. Um, why do I keep pulling up Coifin when what I really want is, maybe I pulled up the, uh, let me see if I pulled up the, oh, we already covered Match, okay. Toast we covered, Verizon. Okay, so Verizon, you know, it, here's what's interesting. Verizon was earning four dollars a share in 2013. It's going to earn four dollars and eighty in 2023. So you know that's excluding this uh, lead nonsense. I mean, they're buying back shares. This is this is like this is like Match, but it hasn't come. Uh, unlike Match, Match at least I know I could get a multi bagger out of, even though it's kind of a dead slowing business. It's fallen you know, 80%, give or take. Um, even if I'm wrong, I probably get a double or a triple out of it. Whereas Verizon, I've got to be perfect to get a double. And, um, you know, it's like, uh, why would I want to make my life that hard when there's way more, way easier things to, do. Let's see if I can get my picture back in the screen. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Operating it out of a foreign place is sometimes. Okay, so here we go. Uh, so I think Verizon's okay if you really are desperate to play the latest headline. Uh, that would be the one to go with. Wait for it to come back down. It may never come back down again, but I think it will. Um, and then you could probably buy it. Where is it? 33. So maybe back in the low 30s. Uh, I, I just, I don't like the reward for the risk. So for me, it's a pass. I hope you guys make a double on it, but it's, it's not interesting enough for me. Um, all right. Uh, Rasa, would there be any particular reason you wouldn't look into T and DZ? Because they weren't good businesses before the lead, never mind after the lead, and the upside for the risk is not worth it in my, oh, Gregory Brink, thoughts on AT&T, okay, uh, <laughs> skip, uh, oh, this is a good question from Brian Okini, love your show, taking your advice on CPS and Intel, uh, uh, by, by the way, uh, as we say every show, this is, opinion, this is my own opinion, I'm just sharing what we do, uh, this is not advice for what you, sh you should do, I don't know, uh, what your situation is. So click on terms, read this. This is opinion, not advice for entertainment purposes only. Um, now, the good question that Brian asks here, he says, I was just curious as a new investor, 
why isn't there any insider buying in Cooper Standard? And this is a great question. Um, I'm going to just leave it at this. They are in a blackout period right now. They just announced that, re remember, they couldn't buy anything while they were doing the, the debt refinancing, um, which basically ended in spring, late spring of this year, so call it after the first quarter. Now we're in July. Technically, they probably could have bought some stock after Q1 earnings uh, for a brief window. Uh, but they're going to report on August 3rd. And my guess would be um, they should be in the market. Now, the reason I bought the stock, one of the reasons I bought the stock, is because ma management was directly aligned with us as major owners in that I believe Jeff Edwards, the CEO, has 189,000 shares of stock. So um, a lot less than we do, but meaningful amounts nonetheless. And um, it wouldn't surprise me to see him in it more, but the guy has been through hell and back. Uh, you know, he's fighting for his life at, at, up until a month or two months ago when they took the solvency risk off the table um, and they pushed everything out to 2027. So I think now that he's caught his breath, the other thing is he was also aggressively, as you've uh, realized in recent calls, negotiating with the OEMs, not only in the U.S., which they've achieved incredible progress on positive uh, pricing adjustment contracts, index-based contracts, and improved pricing, um, uh, they are in aggressive negotiations with European pricing. And the last thing you want to do if you're in negotiations, in my view, if I was in their shoes, I don't know, uh, if I'm negotiating with a major OEM and saying, look, if you don't give us pricing in Europe, we have to shut down the, the plant in Europe because it's not profitable for us. And you got to go find someone else, which would be harder for the OEMs and not great for them. Uh, but if they're not making money on it, there's no reason to keep the region open at all. The last thing you want to do is imply that you're certain that they're going to come around to your side of the table by buying a ton of stock in, in the open market. Uh, then you're counterparty would say, what do they know that I don't know? Uh, or it would be highly presumptuous. So I think that as some of these things get tied up, and we've been seeing every quarter that they get more and more of this stuff resolved, uh, that once the dust is settled and there aren't so many open-ended negotiations occurring, uh, they'd be crazy not to be buyers of the stock in size at these levels like we have been uh, what well, we've been at lower levels, but uh, even at these levels, as I said on Yahoo, it's just getting started in our view. You look a couple of years out, they're earning seven, eight dollars a share, and then it's just a question of do we get a trough multiple of ten times or a peak multiple of twenty times? Uh, but whether you're buying it at five fifty or you're buying it at fifteen dollars, it really doesn't matter when you're talking about a seventy to one hundred forty dollar stock. So uh, I would imagine you're going to start to see more and more of them enter the market as uh, as certainty becomes clearer in, in certain negotiations that they're going through in different regions. Uh, Robert Davis, but that's just my opinion. Um, hope this email... Okay, this is a long one. Uh, hope this email finds you well. First and foremost, I want to express my appreciation for the incredible work you do and the invaluable insights you provide for your podcast. Thank you very much. Your uh, transparency and sharing your investment process is truly commendable, uh, and it has been immensely helpful for people like my family who have dealt with tricky hand in the past few years, uh, blah, blah, blah. In your recent podcast, you mentioned UK REITs and we wanted to bring your attention to Great Portland Estates. We find their management team to be highly capable with the proven track record of successfully navigating previous cycles. Additionally, they own some of the finest buildings in London's West End, primarily comprising A-grade office spaces. We appreciate their low debt levels and their recent ability to raise rents. With approximately 450 million in available cash, they said they were actively seeking further opportunities, reminiscent of Steve Ross' comments at Bernardo. Once again, thank you for your exceptional podcast. Uh, your framework immensely valuable for me and my family. We're truly grateful for your openness and willingness to help the small guys like ourselves. Thank you for your time. Best regards from London, Rob. Rob, thank you so much for the nice note. Sorry I had to read it so quickly, but we're running short on time. Um, okay, so I did take a quick look at this one. Again, for me, it's just a pass because with REITs, you got to, it's not like analyzing a business. You got to know the buildings, you got to know, and I just don't know it. But um, 
just looking on a cursory basis, we can see if it warrants further explorations, which is GPE. Now, the first thing I saw, by the way, Great Portland Estates. Okay, so I, I just pulled this up real quick. And this, for me, is very much like Verizon. Yes, it's distressed, but it's only come down 50% from its pre-pandemic peak. So in a perfect scenario, I have a double. Do I want to take that level of risk for a double in UK real estate? Uh, if this thing was down 70% and it had a decent balance sheet, then I can make, you know, 2x, 3x, 4x, I might be more open-minded to taking the risk. But if you look here, let's take a look at their income statements. So their rental revenues are fine. So far, those things roll off over time, though. They're on a delay lagged basis. Um, so they have... Total debt of 527 million. And on $19 million of cash. You know, down from $350 million of cash pre pandemic. So for me to take that level of risk for a double is a big red flag for me right now. I think you're probably right about the buildings, but that doesn't mean it's not going to be restructured. And when you have restructurings, the equity gets wiped. So um, good buildings are not. There has to be some cushion on their balance sheet to make it work. So for me, it's just not even if you did get the double, it's not worth the level of risk for a double. I mean, there, there are too many easier things to do than, you know, backward ac acrobatics uh, for for a potential. Uh, Xander Widows asks, uh, what's your current evalu evaluation of ASOS? Are you doubling down with the falling share price? Um, well, I think the share price actually rebounded since you wrote this, so you're probably responding to a day. But no, ASOS is a very small position. Uh, we put on the amount that we wanted at low prices, and we'll just wait for it to play out. Um, we're not doubling down on this. This is not a high conviction bet like an Alibaba. So yeah, I guess it bounced down and now it's bounced back up four and a half percent. But um, no, this is not a double down for us. I mean, maybe we'll take another look. I, I think there's like an implied bid for this um, up about double from here and as far as a takeout target. But the jury's still out on the suit from McKinsey. So far, it seems like he's taking all the right actions, but we'll see how it play, plays out. And that's why we never sized into this because we just didn't have its new management. We didn't have any confidence. He hadn't really accomplished anything meaningful in the past other than having a nice looking resume, but not really doing anything. So um, so it's sized for the right size. We haven't gone bigger. We haven't got smaller. We did it exactly right from the beginning. And now we just play out. So far, the facts have not changed. If anything, I think the facts have improved slightly because he is making progress on his initiatives. Uh, so we're going to stick with it. Moving along, Lucas, uh, been following a while. Thanks for the sane and free content in the investment world. Uh, here's one of yours. By the way, at some point, the um, investment clients uh, are going to force me not to do this. Uh, it's it, It'll be some time off, but at some point they're going to just say, look, you know, we're investing with you. This content is going to stay with us. And, and at some point that will be the case. But for now, we continue to do it. And um, uh, so make a ton of money from this and become an investor and you'll have it forever. Uh, but um, here we go. Um, but they know as well as I by logging into their accounts that we're, we're putting out great value here, but they're getting all the, all the greatest value. Uh, and that's the way it will always be. Um, Okay, so here's from Norway. Uh, Elkham ASA traded on the Oslo Stock Exchange. It's a sell the shovel during the gold rush type of business, sell silicon based materials for all kinds of applications that are hypey, can become hype again, chip, solar, etc. It seems to be cyclical business. Dividend is at 23%. Okay, red flag right there, by the way. 
that's going to get cut. Uh, I expect the cycle to swing back the other way, as they always do. Yeah, it probably will swing back the other way. However, in the meantime, the dividend is going to probably get cut. But let's take a look at the stock before we draw conclusions. Um, ELK. All right. Um, let's put this in US dollars. So revenues have grown quite a bit. They dropped off materially in the last 12 months. Uh, positive EBITDA, net income, it's earning about 72 cents a share. Balance sheet, 615 million of cash. Uh, 1.1 billion of debt. Looks okay. Cash flow. That's come down in the last 12 months. Big CapEx business. Uh, cash financing, net change of cash. Positive free cash flow. So let's just see here. How much has it come down? Let's see, ELK. No. Let's see here, ELK. So, margins are solid. Cash flow is growing. Stock hasn't come down much. Let's see. 26 down from 30. So it's barely come down despite you had a big drop off in revenues. And EBITDA. I just don't think that it's be, for what we do, this is not dislocated enough to get excited by. So I think it's just a kind of, you know, let's see here. I mean, the top, top line really took off. So they must have done an acquisition. Um, It doesn't scream huge margin of safety to me, but I'm willing to be corrected. If you want to send more of your research, we can take a closer look at it. Um, Dan Lease, when you buy a bull call spread, how do you determine the strike prices? Ah, that is proprietary, my friend. Anyway, he's talking about the trade service. Um, a lot goes into it, um, but the good news is that the people that do use the service, after you've used it for a few months, you'll you'll start to get a feel for what we look for and how we do it and why it works. And, and uh, you'll be able to uh, start to identify a lot for your own. Just like you're seeing with the AMA questions here, a lot of good thinking coming into a lot of these questions in recent weeks. So you'll learn a lot. You'll be able to do it for yourself in time. Uh, Anthony Salters, what's going on with Disney? We covered Disney last week. It's going, to, you know, uh, Bob Iger set us up. You know, basically, it's going to be a soft quarter. Uh, people are worried about that. Expectations are low, which is always good. Uh, and, you know, a lot of uncertainty with ESPN, et cetera. But this is Disney. Uh, the stock's down, you know, more than 60%. And this is not some nonsense stock. I mean, uh, it's very similar to what happened in 2002. In uh, 2009, 60, 65% seems to be where this thing wants to uh, find find some buyers. And with Iger extending his contract, it'll be fine. So I don't care if it's $80 or $100. You know, if we look out three, four, five years, it'll be back over 200. I like this stock. I'm not worried about day to day. And I think this person was uh, panically 
writing in on a day that the stock was down and it's since kind of bounced a little bit back up. So um, we'll hear his bad earnings. He'll probably kitchen sink it because now he's got four years ahead of him. Uh, and then we'll go on, it'll rebuild and, and the stock will be fine. So with that said, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. We'll be back next week, same time, different place, <laughs> back from a normal office or a place that we do it uh, ordinarily. Uh, in the meantime, we've got three more events out here this weekend. So wish us luck. Uh, the other one, Annabelle and Caitlin.